from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. My name is Betsy Peterson. I'm the director of the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress. And on behalf of the staff, I want to welcome you all today. It's a gorgeous day here, and I'm really pleased that you all are here to share it with us. Um, this is a special program, part of our Homegrown Concert Series, um, part of our lecture series. And it's an opportunity for us to have a, a um, for us to engage in a conversation with individuals who have been awarded the National Heritage Fellowship, um, which is the highest honor given to traditional artists in the United States by the National Endowment for the Arts. And we're thrilled to have actually not just two, we have three here today with us. Um, and that's very exciting. All the way from California, we have Roy and PJ Hirabayashi, uh, the leaders of San Jose Taiko. And we have Daniel Sheehy, the um, ethnomusicologist, director emeritus of Smithsonian Folkways, and actually um, a National Endowment uh, Heritage Fellow for Cultural Advocacy. So he's going to be doing some of his cultural advocacy work today, um, interviewing our artists here. Just as a little bit of background, the Homegrown series is an opportunity for the American Folklife Center to work with cultural specialists, folklorists, ethnomusicologists, artists around the country to identify the very best um, of traditional arts, music, dance, narrative, arts, and work with individuals to bring artists here to share their traditions with all of you and to um, consent, agree to be recorded for our archives. And this session today is no different. It will be recorded. Um, and this conversation will be in our archives so that few future generations can access it. And people around the world will be able to view and listen to it. So with that little caveat, let me ask you to turn off your cell phone if you have um, such a thing and have it on uh, or else you will be memorialized in our archive as well. I also want to thank um, actually while I'm um, on on the um, topic of acknowledgments and talking about partners and individuals we work with. I also want to thank Mark Rooney today of Washington DC who was very gracious um, for loaning his drums today um, because I believe the San Jose Taco drums are over on the mall right now um, and need to stay there. So, um, but at any rate, so our program today, acknowledged as one of the premier music ensembles in the United States, San Jose Taiko was founded in 1973 by young Asian Americans searching to convey their experiences as third generation Japanese Americans and inspired by traditional Japanese drumming, company performers express the beauty and harmony of the human spirit through the voice of the taiko drum and as they strive to create new dimensions um, in music movement and tradition. San Jose Taiko's performances feature visual elements and choreography requiring physical strength, endurance, focus, and energy. And the members of the group participate in composing, choreographing, designing, and fabricating costumes and handcrafting the drums. This collective effort produces a performance that highlights group unity and purpose. In 1987, San Jose Taiko became one of the first American Taiko ensembles to be invited to perform in Japan. They have performed in a wide range of venues from small community centers in, throughout uh, California and schools to Carnegie Hall. In addition to offering extensive educational and community outreach programs, San Jose Taiko is currently working on establishing a Taiko conservatory 
the first of its kind in the United States, which is exciting. I hope we'll hear more about that. Roy and PJ are credited for developing a holistic art form that embraces artistic excellence while also encouraging San Jose Taiko members to become leaders and community builders. So please, let's welcome Roy and PJ Hirabayashi, National Heritage Fellows, and Dan Sheehy. Uh, thank you, Betsy. Uh, you said everything I was going to say, so I don't have anything left to say. <laughs> and thank you all for coming here today. Uh, you, we can't have this presentation without you all here, so you're, you're very much a part of this. And I have to say, that just to start off my, myself, uh, that I'm so incredibly humbled to be here on this little platform with two of the most articulate uh, activist traditional artists that this country or maybe beyond has ever produced. And so it's, 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 I just feel so, so moved and humbled to be here with you all. So thank you for uh, taking the time to come up to the Library of Congress. Oh, thank you, geez. Equally <laughs> honored. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay, so why don't we start with a why question. Why Tycho? And you know, this goes back to, as Bessie uh, mentioned in her opening remarks there, there's, there were things happening in the late 60s and early 70s in California, particularly the Bay Area, perhaps in particular. Can you set the scene and give us a sense of why? Why are we here today? Why, why do we have these drums? Sure. Um, well, yes, in the late 60s, I think for those, probably some of you can remember at that time was really a lot of ha things happening in our country. Uh, the social justice movement was really, civil rights movement was really active. The anti-war movement was going on. Um, and so at that time, um, it was also for a lot of people of color, it was a search of identity, uh, trying, asking the question, oh, well, what is my heritage? What is my ethnic background? Where, where do my um, family, where does my family come from? And how do we fit here in, in America? I'm Sansei, third generation. So my grandparents uh, immigrated here from Japan, from Hiroshima area. Uh, my parents are born here in the United States, but they were actually sent back to Japan to be raised uh, from uh, elementary to high school and then came back uh, to the U.S. just before World War II broke out. So they were primarily Japanese speaking when they returned to the U.S. So they're considered what's called, they're Nisei second generation, but they're considered Kibei, uh, raised in Japan, but American citizens. Um, Sansei, uh, I was born right after World War II in the early 50s, and so at that time, <coughs> For us, uh, for me, it was really kind of the search of who I was as a Japanese American, and within that context of what was going on again in the late 60s. Um, that was the beginning of ethnic studies on campuses. Uh, again, the anti-war movements going on, uh, the war in Southeast Asia. So for, for a lot of us, it was just trying to search how that identity or search for what we were as Japanese Americans um, was really kind of what was going on. And so um, I've always loved music, playing music in different ways. And so when I discovered the taiko, the Japanese drum, uh, I quickly discovered or found that this was a, a voice that was missing in my life. Because growing up, there was no musical voice for me that really connected to my heritage as a Japanese American. PJ, can, can, I, can I just ask, when was that very first moment that, that you heard or saw a taiko drum? Um, well, Actually, uh, growing up, I heard taiko playing in our festivals in, 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 the, in, our, in the Japanese community. But for me to really connect to it, um, it was uh, in actually the early 70s when I first heard a San Francisco taiko group. And there was another group in Los Angeles called the Kinana Taiko. We started San Jose Taiko in 1973. So it was around in that really connecting to the ideas around 1972, 73 on. Yeah, great, thanks. PJ? Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to kind of cap on uh, our similarities, uh, my grandparents are from Japan, um, and my parents were born in California. And uh, I grew up in, well, I was born in 1950, so right after World War II, I went to public school, and um, that was 1955-ish, <laughs> and um, I was the only Asian face at school. 
and I was quickly reminded that I was already different. And there was something about going to school and already being cast out as being different and not included and the separation of like, why am I not being included? So there was already this very seething feeling of inferiority, less than, no self-esteem, and that's how I actually felt, um, you know, not being included for a, a, lot, a long period of time. And so just kind of quickly forward to have heard Tycho in the early 70s, all of a sudden became like, wow, I saw this energy, you know, and they were, there were men and women, they were all dressed up in happy coat, and it's San Francisco Taiko Dojo. And by the way, uh, Sei Chitanaka is also uh, uh, a heritage fellow too. Uh, and to be able to see this um, unabashed energy coming from the stage, this expression, it immediately is like, I want to do that. Almost like, I can do that. How, how can I do that? <laughs> and so it was like that exploration of, uh, okay, I want to find Tycho, how it could become like this, um, I always use the word ballistic. You know, being a woman too, it's like you're always, and, and Asian woman too. <laughs> so ballistic was like, okay, let go. You know, this is self-expression at its best, and I don't have to talk. This is the way I'm going to communicate with you. This is how loud I'm going to become that I could not show you as I was growing up as a little girl. Were women uh, very much a part of the taiko scene that, that you were exposed to back then? In the very beginning, it was very prominent. I mean, I, I would say that, well, for San Jose Taiko, as we started in 1973, we were like about 85% women. women. <laughs> yeah. I think we were all searching for something, whether we were conscious of it or not. You know, it's like that freedom of expression and people coming together and doing something and exploring together. Not, you know, there's kind of a root culture, but how does it affect us living here in America? How does it translate? How is it different? Right. Um, could you, uh, this might be, is this the time to give us a sense of that wow moment? <laughs> what you heard that, that sort of grabbed you and pulled you into this right now? This sure. is part of our plan, just so <laughs> <laughs> so. Orchestrated. Sure, well, this is a great opportunity for us just to demonstrate a piece. Uh, this piece is called Celebration. It's a duet piece that PJ and I wrote. Um, I can't even remember when it was we wrote this, but it was a number of years back. Um, but it, it will feature some of these small drums that we have here. Um, the taiko comes in many different sizes. Unfortunately, we could not bring some of the large ones here today, but we have a nice sample from Mark Rooney to, to show you. Again, celebration.
<laughs> My turn. <laughs> um, we were pleased, uh, Theos and I, to have a little class before you all came here today. So, uh, but but we'll, I think we'll refrain, right? We'll just we'll leave it to PJ. <laughs> uh, so we're moving from the why a little bit into the what. So you heard a little bit of the what. And, and you're looking at some of the what here. Can you tell us what, uh, well, maybe, 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 what is Tycho? Maybe we should just start there and kind of go <laughs> <Right>. and move <laughs> out. <laughs> well, first of all, Tycho is the Japanese word for the Japanese drum. So it refers to all the different sized drums you actually will see in Japan or here in the United States now. And as you can see, just from our small collection here that we're using, um, there's a variety of different styles that the drum comes in. And as I mentioned before, they actually be much larger uh, in Japan or even here in the U.S. You'll see drums that are up to four or five feet in diameter, weighing uh, three, four, five hundred pounds uh, to this much smaller drum that actually be held in one hand. And so um, what we have in collection in general is uh, the barrel style taiko, which they call the nagado drum. Uh, as you see, it's tacked on with a tax in order to put the cowhide on there. And the smaller drums, uh, the real small drum, we call the shime daiko. It's uh, double-headed with rope, and it, you get adjust the tension and the pitch with the rope. And then a, a little bit longer barrel drum in the middle, we call an old kettle drum, which is also barrel style, made out of slat woods. Um, and those drums also are tied by rope with the different heads. And those uh, doketos also come in many different sizes, from much smaller ones that you carry around to larger ones that would sit on a stand. But um, in Japan, again, or here in the United States, we use a variety of different drums in order to create the different pitches, styles, you said within movement or dance also, and in order to really um, create the music that we want to be doing. So maybe what we can explain is what you're seeing today is kind of contemporary. So what, you, what we've been able to infuse in our style is this um, understanding and respect for the roots of where taiko come from, from Japan. And in Japan, taiko was really never uh, used for art's sake. It was is for life's sake. It's to accompany the prayers and chanting for um, good harvest and uh, rain. <laughs> 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 And uh, also to chase away the insects from crops. And in time of bountiful harvest, there was celebration. So for a good harvest. Um, even warriors would use the sound of taiko to frighten their enemy. Um, the villagers would use taiko to have people congregate in the center of the village when there was a time to come together. But um, uh, kumi daiko. K-U-M-I, in Japanese it means ensemble. Ensemble playing really did not become popular until after World War II. Um, and I think this is all from the same reason of like why we play joyfully for celebration. This is after World War II. And in Japan, there were some taiko players, but they felt that, wow, we need to kind of reinvigorate to become, you know, uh, enliven, uplift ourselves for after a harsh world war. And um, that's how kumi daiko started to become popular in Japan. So it's, we're not talking about ancient kumi daiko playing. So um, that's what really infused our interest. Like, how do we use this as a tool of bringing people together, a building community and a, like expression? Um, there was no way, remember, <laughs> when we started the group in the 70s, we didn't have any cell phones or computers. So um, LPs, you know, go, we, we would buy these LPs from Japan and, and play it. And yet there was something about it that we felt that, wow, let's recognize these rich traditions from Japan, but let's just don't copy. You know, we just don't want to copy or appropriate those songs. Let's create music that comes from us. You know, and let's also, we didn't, we couldn't afford drums. Quickly going back, we didn't afford dr drums from Japan because one small drum would cost like 3000 to $5,000 just uh, for a, a group to have. So one of our predecessor groups, uh, Senshin Taiko down in Los Angeles, was very innovative. They took a wine barrel. <laughs> Um, that they bought in, in Los Angeles and wanted to make 
Taiko become accessible like more through the Buddhist uh, temple uh, and activities to draw in young people because there was kind of like uh, the young people were losing interest in Buddhist religion. So uh, Senshi and Taiko, the Kinara. Kinara, Kinara Taiko, excuse me, um, devised these wine barrel Taiko, which actually is the predecessor of American Taiko. And that's what you see here. It's actually a combination. I think there's two drums, the small pitch drums that are roped are from Japan, and the other three drums are actually made here in the States. So if you had your full group here, here we have one, two, three, four, five drums, two uh, players. Uh, what, how many drums and how many people would we have here for a typical San Jose Taiko? For San Jose Taiko, I think we have about 22 performing members. Um, there's, there's occasions at home where we'll play with all, all members and actually fill up an entire room <laughs> on stage. Um, and so, and a variety of drums. So when we tour, actually, we're touring with uh, good, almost 20 different drums of different sizes in order to do one performance concert. Um, it, there's a bass, uh, I guess, uh, style or ensemble of drums, which is about, uh, I guess, about 10 pieces minimum that we would use, uh, but they're much larger than what we have here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I was wondering about that because I thought I could hear the Guarnerian str various strings resonating. Uh, I'm sorry, I just wonder <laughs> if we had like 10 more drums, what would, what would happen to the glass over there? Um, so uh, help us out here. So um, when we're listening to you all perform, or San Jose Taiko perform, what should we pay attention to? I mean, obviously there's movement, there's a visual aspect, there, there's sound, there, there, there's a, quite a bit going on. What, give us something to grab onto here. Well, I would say um, as a viewer, audience, just listen with open mind and open heart. Uh, don't categorize us as saying, that's not authentic from Japan. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I think also what we really want to um, have people experience is kind of finding your own story. How in, in our explanation of the songs that are created by individuals within San Jose Taiko Company, uh, there's uh, a backstory to every, every song. So you, you make it your, we won't tell you exactly what to think. So we want you to kind of like imagine. Um, what I really loved at the end of a performance uh, at a concert uh, in a theater, and we go to the lobby and thank the audience for coming out, we will often hear people say, oh, well, you made me cry, or wow, I'm just feeling so great, and they go, thank you, and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but there's something about that experience that you touch them. You know, if there was that tear that came out, there was something that they were able to experience. So it's kind of like, yeah, we leave it out for the expression to speak so for you get People kind of decide for themselves what they want to take for it within a certain, kind of being guided in a, a certain direction. Right? I, I do say that like in the philosophy of San Jose Taiko, that there's purpose and intention behind everything that we do. And even though we don't tell you, it, it's li literally through our, you know, cells that we're communicating, you know, this, uh, the principles of, playing together as an ensemble of oneness, of open heart, open mind. Um, that, that, um, Bessie Peterson mentioned that, that uh, the opening remarks that I was trained as an ethnomusicologist. And one of the things that I gathered from all that training was uh, that music has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. I mean, it has absolutely no meaning whatsoever, except for the meaning that people give it. And I'm curious, what can you talk a little bit about the, the two sides of that conversation? Like, what meaning, examples of meaning that you've given the music, either musically or in terms of that story behind it, as you were saying? And then, what meaning have you seen people take from it or add to it? You know, like people sitting here, right here today. Can you give us a sense of those the two sides of that conversation a little bit from your experience? Sure, um, I'll start with that. Um, <clears throat> 
Well, when we started Sounds of Taiko, we were the third group to begin here in North America, and, um, and probably at that time outside of Japan, as far as this particular ensemble form. So we were, as PJ mentioned, trying to draw from um, experience or sounds that we felt were coming from Japan, but more importantly, what was we felt we grew up as, as Japanese Americans. And so the music we were writing early on um, really incorporated a lot of that influence. And so when you hear our music, uh, you may kind of sense sort of a jazz or Afro-Cuban thing going on or polyrhythmic stuff happening. And so uh, you might get that kind of sense of, of rhythm going on uh, that you'll be hearing when we're playing. And so um, I'm hoping as, as a musician or as a taiko player that people, one, are listening to us as, as, uh, as, as musicians are playing music that um, really kind of touches different aspects of what you may really enjoy as a, as a, as a listener or just a enjoy of music. Um, so you might sense uh, the soloist doing different things and that kind of thing's happening and also diff different textures of what the, the different drones may be doing at the same time. And so um, it's really trying to combine a lot of that, and then all on top of that is the movement. So for those who enjoy dance and movement, there's that part, piece of what Taiko is all about too. So we're trying to combine what we many times refer to as dancing with the drums. So uh, uh, so the audience could really kind of enjoy that kind of variety of what's happening. So we're hoping that. Um, as an audience member, you're not just focusing on one person, but you're looking at everybody and really have a hard time watching as an ensemble because each person is doing something different uh, rather than like watching, say, um, an orchestra or string ensemble where it's a little bit more stationary. And so with that, it's really just trying to create that the vibrancy of playing the drum, having the opportunity to uh, just enjoy what we're playing and hopefully passing that on to you too so you can enjoy that experience too at the same time. It's so multidisciplinary as Roy's saying. There's the physical aspect, the musical aspect. There's kind of like um, the theatrical aspect as well. So as an audience, um, it, I, I imagine uh, somebody in a different discipline, ethnic, you know, art, uh, going, wow, I wonder what that sounds like if we got together. <laughs> I, I like to, I'm feeling that there's also this inciting excitement of exploration. Um, even as an artist, you don't have to be musical, maybe. It's like, I want to just experience what it's like to hit that drum, you know? And uh, yeah, that's the invitation. What, what about stepping back, let's say, you know, a, a football field or whatever, conceptually? Um, festivals I've gone to, for example, looking for a representation of who is in a community or who's in a broader community or whatever. And it seemed like over the years that Tycho has been selected as one of those potent expressions that, that it's, it's, it's more than music in a general kind of way. What, do you have a take on that or yourself or what, what have you seen? Or, you, you, know what I'm, you know what I'm yes. attempting to say here? Yes, <laughs> and, um, and we're excited about the fact that you know, we're, I mean, again, we are trying to be serious about our musical form and what we compose, but uh, as, a, as a form and a musical entity that we're really trying to build the community. And so we realize that the drum is a calling instrument for the community itself. And so like you're mentioning, um, I mean, we play for, city hall officials, uh, football games, and festivals, and school assemblies, and I mean, weddings, and even unfortunately funerals we've been asked to play at. But it's just, it's basically it's asked, being asked to use the drum to, as a voice to call people together and to share that experience. And so um, that's one really important thing that we felt about what Taiko for us and what Sounds Like Taiko's been trying to do is um, use the, uh, the instrument and our, our music as a way to help gather people together and bring people together to, to enjoy what's happening as, as a community itself. I have to add with that that the first three Taiko groups, of which we are the third, um, actually were uh, started from Japan towns. Three Japan towns were made in the United States that are physical entities still and recognized as Japan towns. Los Angeles, San, San Francisco, and San Jose. So in that way, we see like how important it became as um, a pioneer voice for these communities that, you know, it's like, oh, 
I, I like to learn more, you know, it's like also, hey, there's this celebration, you know, this happening in Japantown, come on out. And so there's also this awareness building of what the community is in the larger city. Um, and then also we always used to be asked, well, do you have to be Japanese to play the taiko? And I think, uh, you know, that at the very beginning it was like, no, you don't, but please understand that we're kind of exploring ourselves. It, it, and it is a voice for the Japanese American experience. So if you can be patient and understand that's what we're exploring, then yeah, come join San Jose Taiko. And to be respectful of the tradition and, and, and the history of like what this community has gone through. What, uh, your, uh, San Jose Taiko is number three. Um, have, has there, what are the differences say between what Seiji Tanaka did in the San Francisco? Uh, Bay Area in, in, in Quinada and in, in, uh, Los Angeles and what you were all doing and even looking in today uh, uh, hoping to get a little sense of you today how things have evolved over the years but how are things is everybody the same or with the same philosophy or are there differences between no, there are differences in, um, in basic philosophy. Uh, Seichi Tanaka, San Francisco Taiko Dojo, really, he was trained in Japan. Um, he's an immigrant from Japan. And so um, he really had brought, brought the uh, Japanese traditional, folk traditional of style of festival drumming to, to America, basically. And so, um, so his, his style and form really kind of lies in that, in that direction of playing. Uh, Kinata Taiko was based out of the Senshin Buddhist Temple, the Buddhist church in uh, Los Angeles, central LA. And so Reverend Moscodani and those folks uh, really kind of focused on using the Taiko within the, the temple and the religion and their activities around that. Um, still a little bit more contemporary in a sense, but philosophically is really around the, the ideas of, of the religion and the temple. And so when we started San Jose Taiko, as we mentioned, we came from a little bit more of a Japanese American and Asian American perspective and realizing that we didn't have that kind of training, um, that we were just trying to create our music based upon what we felt. So um, it was really uh, using a lot of other different ideas in order to create the music. And so we feel that San Jose Taiko, we took more of the contemporary um, vein of, of, of looking at how to create our music and style. And so when you look at music, uh, the Taiko scene now, uh, you could probably trace it back to San Francisco Taiko, more traditional to a little bit the Buddhist uh, path that the uh, Kinanda Taiko took and then uh, more the contemporary style that we've taken. Um, in Japan, I feel that, um, and I'm not saying this to brag or boast, but I feel that what we've done here in the United States uh, has really kind of influenced now what's going on in Japan. And although the Japanese Taiko folks feel they're more traditional in that sense, again, as PJ mentioned, this art form for us, this particular style only started about the early 1950s. And so um, Taiko, in the United States, or particularly, this has been um, running parallel to what's going on in Japan for about at least a good two thirds of that lifespan of this art form. And so, um, with that, I think we've greatly influenced now what's happening in Japan as far as the taiko scene, or the kumi taiko scene, uh, where things that we were being criticized for early on as far as using other instrumentation, we would bring in the cowbell and other rhythm patterns and non Japanese instruments. Now it's used all over, especially in Japan. And um, just the, the rhythmic sense that we're doing, that we were doing early on, is also being copied also all over. And so uh, it's interesting that uh, I think Amer ta Taiko in America has influenced um, what has gone now internationally because now you see Taiko very popular in Europe and Australia and Asia and other countries and also South America. So it's really gone way beyond what we experienced early on. So, so sorry, Peter. Yeah, actually, I, I wanted to say, besides what you hear and see, uh, you know, I think the, the three seminal groups that started, we were very distinct in our organization. And um, coming from, like, community organizing backgrounds or activism, um, we wanted to be very clear that we wanted some cooperation, a cooperative collective style of of interaction and, and how we uh, operated as a group. So unlike a traditional Japanese uh, ryu or school, um, where it's always top down, there, there is really no lateral approach to that. So that's what we were doing. We we're just kind of making it a, a lateral even 
way of people inputting ideas, being, being creative, how do we share responsibility. So I have to say that that kind of still remains very distinct. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's that's big, <laughs> essentially. Okay, in terms of quantity, okay, we, we got up to three. Uh, where, what's where where are we now in the United States and then beyond the United States in terms of groups or however you want to you know, express it? Um, well, the North for for the longest time I was hearing about maybe three hundred groups in North America, but someone corrected me recently saying it's probably closer to four hundred fifty in North America alone. Um, and South America now, Tycho has been so popular, it becomes real popular too, last 15, 20 years. So uh, there's, there might be almost equal number to, to that extent. And as I mentioned, in Europe now, it's really, uh, it's just amazing. And when countries were, um, you would not think Tycho exists as an ensemble. Uh, it's, it's springing up all over Europe. And so it's, uh, it's really grown quite a bit. Uh, outside of Japan, basically. Does that include the, you know, their sizable Japanese communities in, in Brazil and right. Peru, for example? Is right. that, are those yes. a, they, important they, they've really nodes? Started a lot. Of, um, right. Yeah. And, and, and PJ, you mentioned a while ago that, that um, a lot of people who are not of Japanese uh, descent are interested in performing uh, and are performing uh, taiko music. Can you, can you tell us about that a little bit? How is that? Big, a little bit. Is it? Or are there must be special stories. Or I think that there is that flat line universal concept, and that's heart. <laughs> so you know, it doesn't matter where or what you are. Uh, it just kind of an, an open door. Well, that's what we try to do: is how to make Tycho accessible. And. Um, it's very interesting. I mean, there's no way of knowing how Taiko is growing or in what communities it's developing. Um, yes, there's a lot more non-Asian faces that are creating Taiko groups. And then it's very interesting to see a lot of non-Asian faces that are really promoting Taiko from Japan. Um, and uh, it's interesting to see the diversity of like people being inspired and influenced by what the source of where Tycho is coming from. Mm -hmm. How American is Tycho? I mean, that's kind of a <laughs> let me purposefully ask. dumb question. Well, <laughs> let me ask, how many of you know what sushi is? There you go. OK, right? OK, so that's what tanaka say from San Francisco Tycho Dojo said. Yep. You know, Tycho will have hit the scene if Tycho becomes as ubiquitous as sushi. <laughs> Well, it's pretty ubiquitous. I think it is. <laughs> oh, and you don't, yeah, to hear it in commercials, you know, very subliminally on, on TV, you know, it's like it's already in uh, compositions. Look, we have a couple more pieces before we, we, we all adjourn here, but I, is, is, it, is, it, is it okay to ask for questions? People, who's in, somebody in charge? Can we do that given, the, given this? Yes, oh, there's a microphone for people to ask questions. That's tr terrific. So we'll, let's let uh, Thea be our, our intermediary here. How's that? Thank you. You were talking about trying to find uh, the uniqueness of Japanese for the experience through the taiko drum. And as you mentioned, there are many Japanese in Brazil, and there's samba there. And if anybody that came from another country and started playing the drums, they would play in their unique culture. What makes Taiko unique for Japanese? And I guess specifically the rudiments, the time signature, uh, the um, collaboration in unison. You have to feel each other out while you're playing together. Anything you can describe in regards to the Taiko style for Japanese and that experience for being Japanese? Um, well, it's uh, definitely changed over, over the years since um, I guess the Kumi Daiko style has kind of started. Um, <clears throat> so traditionally, especially when you talk about the festival drumming that goes on in Japan, um, rhythmically it's, it's pretty simple and pretty repetitive. And so, uh, because basically they're accompanying a dance or that kind of form. Um, and so it was, 
it was Daihachi Uguchi in Japan that started the, the ensemble format, and then he was the first to take a composition and write it using just taiko for itself to kind of use those voices for other, other instruments or having dance or other movement to it. And so with that context, he started to really look at how to compose or create pieces within, within a way of where you're just hearing drums with different voices of different sides, tones, and, and whatever. And so um, rhythmically, I guess, traditionally, I guess taiko in a dance scene or accompanying other things is, is pretty much standard 4-4 you know, four, four or whatever. But uh, now, I guess in contemporary form, uh, many groups are writing or composers are writing in other time signatures and just moving around. And so um, for us in San Jose Taiko, we've been doing that for quite a while because we were highly influenced by the samba, the Afro-Cuban rhythms and things, and in a polyrhythmic sense. So we have pieces that are seven, four, five, four, and other, other time signatures. And um, we try to actually move in and out of that. So it's not a sense that also you're feeling you're just locked into that one, but just being able to play in a different signature so that it feels more, you know, it feels pretty natural in other words. Um, so, but for a taiko, traditional taiko player, it's very unnatural. And so um, we've been, again, early on criticized because we were told that our music was too complicated for the Japanese taiko audience in general, because uh, we were just too uh, layered on our rhythm patterns and taking it out of time signature of the straight 4-4. Four, four. Um, whereas now, again, you're hearing that all over and it's just very common. Perhaps another thing that, that's, it's kind of, it's musical. It, it is um, your energy. It's ki or chi, um, where in, in Japan, you would say, see that that's the main foundation of like why people come together. And I think that's what all uh, taiko groups strive to practice and also uh, keep rooted. So it's not taking the taiko drum and uh, making it just an instrument to have a different sound. It's like how do you really insert that uh, respect and that energy? Good. Thank you. Yes, there's one right here then. You may have answered this question before I arrived, and if so, I apologize. Uh, when I think of ta ta taco drums, I think of those great huge drums where you have to almost lie down in order to play them. And when I was upset, I was thinking, gee, I'd like to do that to get rid of some of my tensions. Is that part of the Japanese traditional taiko, and now you've evolved from that? Today's set is very special, again, from <laughs> Mark H. Rooney uh, Taiko Group. Um, we couldn't get this past security, so it had to be small drums. So I'm sorry, no, no big drums today. Yo, oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Do you have any videos on YouTube that people could find? Oh, well, yes. If you look San Jose Taiko YouTube, you'll see a lot of different videos of the different kinds of performances. A lot of more festival settings, but you'll see a lot of different drums and uh, concert video, too. Yes. Yes. I just wanted then, to ask a question there. about the choreography, the movement. Uh, you obviously, when you did Celebration, there are movements that you're doing. How does that relate to the rhythm? How do you compose or conceive those? Um, I think choreography became a very instantaneous connection for the expression of San Jose Taiko. Um, well, for myself, I, I also grew up uh, as a dancer, tap ballet, you know. <laughs> but there is something, it, the cellular, the muscle memory inside, you know, it's like that wants to groove almost before you become a musician. <laughs> And, and so that's how uh, San Jose Taiko was trying to integrate movement a lot more so than what we saw from Japan happening. Um, and since then, it, it's like I think people are influ influencing each other. And where can you take movement? Uh, how do you express? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole just lighting, the whole state, there's all. all. Sorts of pictures. Yes, uh, uh, sorry, Theo, I, I committed to uh, back, <laughs> back here next. Yes, right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is a good opportunity. I'm a PJ, a little while earlier, you mentioned that there were three extant Japan towns in LA and San Jose and San Francisco. Would you say that the development of Taiko had an effect on the preservation of those? And if so, can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it, well, because I think uh, we're just so connected to San Jose, Japantown, and our community is so supportive of us. They go, you're the heartbeat of San Jose, Japantown. And <laughs> it's like, no, I, I really feel that um, the presence of arts in general, you know, and to be a part of like all these celebrations during the year in Japantown, kind of really elevated our prominence and exposure, our visibility, you know, that uh, um, little kids want to play taiko. So it's like this new generation, uh, it's like the seeding, right? And it's continuing. I mean, all, our little kids now are now married and have their own kids and we're going, Oh, no kidding. <laughs> so it, there's such pride and surprise, I would say, you know, to see that there's kind of like, wow, I never had that while growing up as the silent, no esteem kid, you know, in kindergarten. Now it's like these kids are just like flourishing with uh, wonderful self-esteem. Is, is this a, a, a springboard into the conservatory idea? Because uh, this is something special. There are all kinds of ways to innovate. This is another way to innovate. That... Right. Well, San Jose Taiko has been um, working on this idea. Well, we've been doing a conservatory, conservatory concept for quite a while now. Program-wise. Uh, Program-wise, right. And so we just feel we're trying to uh, put it under one category, roof of, of terminology in a sense. But really it's our outreach program, our master classes that we offer um, for college to uh, other adults. Uh, so it's a variety of classes and our training program we have for our performing members. Um, we feel we have probably one of the most rigorous training programs for a member to join San Jose Taiko that exists here in the U.S. right now. And so um, all of these things are part of what we consider as an important part of uh, teaching Taiko and also spreading it through our performances, whether it's our concert programming, our outreach program into the schools, our festival programming, um, and our touring that we do as, a, as an ensemble. And so um, it's uh, something that's been going on for a while. We're now on the verge of actually um, an important piece for us has been a physical site. And so we're now uh, actually moving forward to building our own building uh, along with some other partners that at least have a permanent rehearsal space. And so um, we're just launching a capital campaign on that. So and if anyone wants to support us, <laughs> <laughs> I know you probably understand what that means. Um, it is happening in San Jose, it's Japan. It's in San Jose, Japan town. So we're very proud of that too. Uh, and we're partnering with several other arts organizations. But uh, we look to have our own permanent space. Hopefully within the next three to four years, that will be completed. So we're very excited. Uh, and having uh, personally worked at the National Endowment for the Arts for 23 years or so, and having followed uh, uh, San Jose Taiko and, and, and the Taiko in general, uh, I, I expect that this dimension of giving to the community, of thinking bigger than music and performance, was part of the reason that you were awarded the National Heritage Fellowship by the National Endowment for the Arts as well. So again, one more time, congratulations on that, and, and thank you. Thank you. Um, and there was a question here. There's yes. Thank you. I was very interested, you know, you mentioned, PJ, your background is in dance. Does someone who plays another instrument have a leg up if they decide they want to try taiko, uh, say a pianist or a cellist, or does it matter? I don't want to stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really interesting to see that people who say, oh, I'm a drummer, you know, a trap drummer, I, I can do that. Uh, it's a different experience. It's like once you put the choreography in, oh, wow, my arm doesn't extend that far and I can't do that many be beats, you know. It, no, you all start from zero. In fact, that's what we do for training. No matter what experience you have, when you come to San Jose Taiko, I'm sorry, you're going to have to strip to zero because we're going to just layer that training within, you know, layer by layer. So part of our, uh, well, you have one more question here? Yes, we, 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 I, does any, we want to hear a little more music, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, so let's, let's have another question. It's okay, just tell me. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, I'm from Indonesia, and um, we sort of regard our instruments as, um, I don't know, holy or sacred, or we have to respect them. Do you teach them to respect, like you cannot step over it and you don't put stuff on it? 
and uh, people don't understand, you know, and uh, so you always have to teach them. Yes. Um, there's the values that are integrated towards the pra practicing of Taiko. And um, just because Taiko itself is made out of three natural um, elements, uh, wood from tree, hide from animal, metal tacks from earth, you know, just to really understand, well, this is what's gifting us with this sound. And each sound has its own voice. How do you respect even that voice? Like this drum is like another person. How do you respect that drum as I can equally respect you? Um, so it's like looking at each as a living being. Yeah, uh, I think you know, lots of people don't, I think lots of people don't understand that. You know. Thank you for asking that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And thank all of you for all of your questions. And do um, you think you could lead us into what's going to happen now? Yeah, with, you um, do. I think it's important. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, we're going to play this one song actually from Japan. It's called Hachijo. And the reason why we want to play this is because Hachijo is this very small island off the main island, uh, Honshu, uh, not too far from Tokyo. And uh, Hachijo was regarded as an island of exile, where they sent political prisoners. And um, yet people were uh, exiled to this little island. It still flourished as their own community. So just because you are exiled <clears throat> doesn't mean that you can still find beauty in life. So they were able to take the hachijo drum or create a hachijo drum or a very small drum where it wasn't used for art's sake per se. It was there to celebrate where people would load up and get drunk <laughs> at parties and people just go up and they just play on the drum. Um, and the reason why Roy and I really wanted to learn this piece is because we felt that it really kind of paralleled the Japanese American experience. Uh, during World War II, the West Coast Japanese, Amer Japanese people of Japanese ancestry were incarcerated into like 10 different camps, camps throughout the US. And um, although they were there for three years during World War II, their communities in these camps still were able to find beauty and flourish. And um, so we're playing this kind of like that uh, sense of freedom, sense of uh, connection, and finding beauty in whatever conditions, like today. So we're, uh, um, I'm personally being challenged to play this because Hachi Joe is usually on an up drum like this, and it's this high. So if you see me whiffing at air, it's because it's a different <laughs> style.
Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Other than mine. <laughs> yes, back here we have a question. It's very beautiful. Um, so I'm originally from Los Angeles, and uh, of course I know taiko drumming, especially at UCLA, is very, very popular. Um, they used to play underground in the parking lot <laughs> when I was there 15 years ago. But now um, I wanted to ask about storytelling with um, music and specifically with taiko drumming. Okay, so um, but in the context of how taiko can be used in storytelling, you know, we've um, we've worked with uh, performance artists and theater companies in that in that way, and so and actually PJ's done a lot of work with uh, Nobuko Miyamoto, who's based in Los Angeles, with Great Leap, who's a great storyteller, dancer, singer, and so um, and actually taiko can be used in many different ways to accompany that kind of action and things, and um, and we've been. Um, I guess adding to that in different, uh, I guess, um, projects we've been doing more recently, uh, whether it's uh, storytelling with a sense of dance, like Buto dance, or storytelling within theater, like working with Luis Valdez and some of his newest works that's going on from uh, the El Teatro Campesino. Um, so what we're trying to do is really how can the, the music or the voice of the taiko be added on to, to what's happening in that context is uh, something we're trying to do. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. We, we personally would like to do more of that, uh, but it has been happening for quite a while. Just one re recent um, project that San Jose Taiko has just did, and they're developing it, so it'll come out again next year. It's a, um, a collaboration of three different groups, and it's San Jose Taiko, um, the Wesley Jazz Ensemble, and also um, Epic Immersion Theater. So this is just only last weekend that it was uh, performed, and it was an immersive experience where the audience were told ahead of time, this is not a sit-down concert, <laughs> that you are going to be in the round, and that um, actors are going to be coming in between you. And we also inspire you to dress up in 1940 vintage clothing, mm -hmm. um, because it was a uh, <coughs> swing. It was a swing big band era, jazz. yeah, big band jazz. And so what the story was, like um, big band jazz was very prominent in these internment camps during World War II. And it was the, the, it was the, the activity of dancing and making music that people found substance and, you know, uh, of living and, and living out their lives in camp. And so, um, it was really wonderful to see how it sparked off this energy of people getting up and dance when um, the jazz ensemble started to play, you know, and then interspersed with the dialogue to talk about what was happening when they had to decide and show allegiance. Do I sign up for and get drafted? You know, here I'm in camp, but how do I show my allegiance to America? by serving the country. So yes, I think we're, we're also exploring and trying to find those ways to really empower the potential of what our arts can do. Well, you've certainly empowered me and I think a number of people in this, group, <laughs> this room today. So Piche Hirabayashi and Roy Hirabayashi, thank you so much. Thank you for thank all you. you've done. Thank you for being with us here today. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.